Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. In the studio today, two amazing ladies when you get a chance to read their bios and i say bios because these two women have accomplished oh so much in this business and and i'm just i'm thrilled that they're here in the studio with us today and we're going to talk about what they're doing and uh what they've accomplished and all that really good stuff candy oteri is with us along with jc valeris welcome to the show thank you so much thank what you. a pleasure to be on the business side of music I'm so excited. Well, thank, you. thank you. Okay, so we're we're going to start at the very beginning because that's what we always do. You were in radio when when Candy when when you started. You've been doing radio for a long time, I take it. Twenty five years on the number one FM in Boston called WMJX Magic one hundred six point seven. Right. And before that, I'd spent my entire career as a singer full time. And so radio was a really nice transition for me because if I wasn't singing the songs. I was hearing them in my headphones. Right. Yeah. And JC, how'd you get started in this crazy business we call the music industry? I, I just loved music from the time I was a little girl, and I always knew it was what I wanted to do with my life. So I started singing when I was about six years old. And then when I was about 13, I noticed all of your lovely... Uh, you lovely hangings on your walls. I see Leanne Rhymes everywhere. Right. And Leanne Rhymes was the reason I got into country music. She was my exact age. I thought she was super cool because wow. she was winning Grammy Awards at 13. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, this could be something really interesting to try. So I started singing country music and then I started writing. And that's what inevitably brought me to Nashville. Where are you from originally? Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Okay. So you're both mass girls. Yes. We are. Yeah. In fact, uh, JC, when she first reached out to me, through email to introduce herself to me, she said in the first sentence, I grew up listening to you on the radio. <laughs> I sure so did. Right away, I got my cane out. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, how did that make you feel? You know what? It never, it never gets old. It's always such a pleasure when someone comes over to me and says... Oh, I, I hear your voice. Oh, let me close my eyes. I hear your voice. I know who you are. That never gets old. And of course, JC, you've got your company called uh, Platinum Circle Media, right? Yes. Let's talk about that for a minute. How did that company come about and, and what, is it, what does it do? Well, I have always done my own marketing, social media, any kind of design aspect that had had to go along with my career when I was growing up. I always did that on my own. My parents couldn't afford to hire me a manager or a publicist or someone to do that for me. So I taught myself. And when I got to Nashville and I was writing and working with a lot of artists, I noticed that they needed the skill set that I had. They didn't have a website or they didn't know how to present an album, you know, digitally on their social media. So I started helping friends. And one thing turned into another, and I started getting hired by some artists in Nashville who were doing some really cool things. Wow. And in 2012, I decided to take all of those artists and launch a business. And I launched Platinum Circle Media, and we do everything from website to, website design to graphic design, social media, and all, all of the digital marketing things. And then you two got together. Yes. We did. Introduction through email. Right. Yeah. I get this really sweet email from this girl named JC Dawn Valeris. And she says to me, I've been listening to you since I grew up. I was running an organization in Boston that I co-founded called Boston Women in Media and Entertainment. And I'd spent a lot of my career doing what I could, Bob, to help bring other women along in the field of media and entertainment. And she wanted to join our organization and said, I live in Nashville, but I grew up in Boston. Can I join your group? And I said, of course you can. And the more I talked to her on the phone later, and the more I got to know her, the more I realized... I need to interview her and put her on my primary podcast, which is the story behind her success. And she came to Boston to visit her family, and we quickly got together, and I recorded her story. And at the end of that interview, it became very clear to me that I needed to spend more time with this incredibly talented young woman. And over the course of that following year, I actually started using her services. She was helping me build my platform uh, and rebrand myself. 
And when I came here to do a four-part series with JC to Nashville last year on women in country music for the Story Behind Her Success podcast, we looked at each other and said, wait a minute. There are so many stories in this town that need to be told. And they're not just women. They're men. They're young. They're old. And we just decided country music success stories. We're going to do it together. We had a conversation. Excuse me. We had a conversation on a previous podcast. In fact, one of our more recent ones where we talk about women in the music industry. And I think... I'm going to I'm going to put it this way. The the glass ceiling for women has been so much harder than it has been for men. There's many more doors to go through. There's many more obstacles. Have you heard those stories from the folks that you have interviewed that this is this is a tough business? Okay, so it's a tough business no matter what, whether you're a guy or a gal. Uh, Are you getting the impression that it's been tougher for women from day one to get a foot in this door and then be success, see some success out of it? Let me answer that really from the broadcast perspective. Yeah. And then maybe you can take it from the talent perspective. In my tenure at Magic 106.7, I rose from being the secretary to the program director to a full-time on-air talent, but also to the assistant program director, which is second in command of the radio station. This is a Marconi award-winning station, two million people a, w- a week we cumed. And as I became more and more involved in the music, now get, now understand this is an adult contemporary station, not a country station, but what I've learned in radio is true for country as well. My boss and my music director would sit down to decide what songs we were going to add that week. Right. And we would listen to songs, and I was part of this meeting, and we would also entertain record people who would come in and pitch records. But here's the thing. When you're programming a music hour in adult contemporary music, there's an, a rule unspoken that you can't play two females back to back. So, Bob, if you can't play two females back to back, but you can play two males back to back. Yeah, I was going to say, wait a second. Then automatically women are getting half of the airplay. Aren't they? Wow. So there's a little thing that I said, wait a minute, that's not right. Most recently, there's a programmer in Boston. His name is David Corey, and he was programming a station called WKLB, which I'd been on, and JC's had airplay on that station. And he wrote a big article in Billboard magazine about how we need to change that. And those rules need to be broken. And as soon as they are in programming, and as soon as women get an equal share of airtime, this problem won't be happening anymore. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, it, fascinating. But at the same time, it's still out there. It's 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 another obstacle. From a performer perspective, was it frustrating when you couldn't get songs on the radio maybe as easily as guys could? Or were you seeing that? that? I have to be honest with you. I have never personally experienced it. I know a lot of people who have. I've always looked at it like this. There have been a lot of meetings, especially music business meetings that I've been in. I would say 90% of them where I am the only female in the room. But I've never walked into those meetings thinking I'm going to be the only female. I've always walked in just thinking I'm a person in the meeting. And I think there's a certain mindset for whatever reason. I have always had that mindset. So I've never gone into a situation feeling like the underdog or the person that had to speak louder or something like that. You didn't have your guard up. Exactly. Now, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen because I know multiple people, especially women in the music industry, that that's happened to. But you had asked the initial question was about the guests that we've been interviewing viewing. And Jeannie Seeley comes to mind immediately because this woman is the first woman to ever be the female host of a segment on the Grand Ole Opry. She's also the first woman to ever wear a miniskirt on the Grand Ole Opry, and she received a lot of flack for it, too. Wow, see, I didn't know that. But she did it, and she paved the way for every single female behind her. And it took a woman like that to be able to 
pave that way for a Carly Pierce or Carrie Underwood or a Lori Morgan to come along and have that same opportunity. And how incredible that there are females in country music who have stood up for their right in that way. You know, I'd love to add a quote from Jeannie Seeley from that episode where I don't remember who her gener- general manager was at the Opry, but he said, Seeley, I'm going to run you out there and you better not screw this up because if you do, it's going to be bad for both of us. <laughs> so I feel like there are times when we do break through the glass ceiling, Bob, yeah. but if you don't get through that ceiling in high in high style, you've screwed it up for a long time. Right. <laughs> you know, it, the, the stakes are high. So you two have got together and you have, you first of all, you're doing podcasts yes. and I use that in a plural sense because yes. it's multiple podcasts that you're doing and you, you two have created a, a program that does what? Let's talk about that. Country Music Success Stories yeah. brings our listeners firsthand into the lives of country music icons, into their homes, onto their back porches. Uh, into their barns, onto their dining room tables where we all sit around and I can see journals of songwriting journals from from Kent Blasey. Today we sat with John Berry and his beautiful wife Robin at their home and they said, welcome to our dining room table. And we had a conversation about their career. That we think is what makes our show very special. When you go into the star's home, or their favorite place. Maybe it's their recording studio, as is the case for Crystal Gale on on Music Row. You're in their space. And the connection that I can make between myself and this country music icon is so genuine and so authentic because they feel comfortable in their own home, in their own space. And the stories that they end up telling us are very often stories that have never been told before. I I think that in itself is, well, we're going to dig into that some more. Let's get a break, get a word in from one of our sponsors. When we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with Candy O'Terry and J.C. Valeris. When you have a cord synth at your fingertips, the possibilities are endless. Be it digital, analog, analog modeling, altered FM, wave sequencing, or the multi-engine synth. Core gives you easy access to a variety of features to help you get the perfect sounds quickly. Whether you're a professional musician or just starting out, Korg truly has a synthesizer to help you express yourself. Visit Korg.com or your favorite Korg dealer to get your hands on one of their products to create new music always. Korg, the official sponsor of the business side of music. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee. Sitting across the microphones, and I'm going to say microphones because we have two people in the studio today. Candy O'Terry and J.C. Valeris are with us. Ladies, let's pick up where we ended on the previous segment, which is the stories that these artists are sharing with you. One of the things that we try to do in our show, obviously the business side of music, we talk a lot about the industry, the music business. But every once in a while, we get those golden nuggets where you get an artist who has some history, has some legacy about them, and you just want to kind of sit back and let them tell the stories. Because one day they're not going to be around, and we need to archive, we need to archive those stories now. Are, are you seeing the same thing? I, first of all, you are just hitting the nail right on the head, Bob. Recently, JC and I have been so fortunate to talk to Larry Strickland, bass singer for Elvis Presley, why, a husband of Naomi Judd, T.G. Shepard, legendary 21 number one songs. He was a homeless kid in Memphis, Tennessee at 15 when Elvis Presley's Cadillacs drove into a roller rink parking lot at midnight because Elvis had rented the roller rink for the night. And Elvis took one look at this kid outside the roller rink and said, hey, I'm one man short on my team. You want to go roller skating with me? And T.G. looks at him and says, "Uh, yes, sir. And that night, T.G. had nowhere to sleep. He'd been sleeping in doorways, ends up at Graceland, ends up being mentored by Elvis Presley. 
I've been at Naomi Judd's compound and I have seen Larry Strickland on a couch five feet away from her. She'll turn and look at him and say, what's the matter with you? Why are you crying? And he'll say, you're breaking my heart, Naomi. I didn't know that happened to you. (laughs) These are the stories that we get. She was so poor at one point, she had to use a ringer washing machine in her no electricity house on a mountaintop, a stinking mountaintop in Kentucky, because she couldn't afford to go to the wishy-washy. Yeah. These are the stories that you just can't believe. JC? Absolutely. And I think the other part and the really cool thing about our podcast is we're taking the experiences and the stories from these gigantic success stories and then giving younger artists the opportunity to learn from them. One of the things that is so important to me is being a good mentor. And it's something that I never had when I was growing up. I always say my favorite quote was be who you needed when you were younger. What What's that quote again? Be who you needed when you were younger. Wow. And I've always tried to make a promise to myself that if I was in a position to help someone else, just like I needed when I was starting out, that I would always do that. And that was one of the uh, the ideas behind launching Music City Mentor, which is my segment of the podcast. So we're taking a gigantic star who has achieved the ultimate success in country music, learning about their journey to that success, and then giving advice to a younger artist on how they can, too, have that thing. And it's pretty incredible when you think about all the different ways and all the different stories that we're getting on how they've achieved this success. There's one thing that they all have in common, Bob, and that is they worked damn hard to get there. Yeah. And it is true of anybody we've spoken to. John Barry said to us today, some people get a little more fairy dust than others. (laughs) That's true. So uh, but the but the road to success is long. And here's the thing. In order to have longevity as an artist, you have to work so hard to keep that fame, to keep that success story. It never ends if you you have to keep on pushing. And we've learned that from everybody. We used to say in in the record business when we would sign an artist that it was seven years or seven records, whichever came first. And that was about the lifetime of what a label could expect from an artist. Now, at that point, it was... Maybe I should say, after that point, it was up to the artist. Am I going to continue to do this? And, and it's a work ethic. And you really have to, you have to want to do that more than anything else, more than anybody else. Because it, it's so competitive out there in this industry. You know, you were talking also about a sense of history. And I had mentioned these Elvis stories. But what we're becoming, we're becoming very aware of the fact that when you sit down with a Larry Strickland and you sit down with a T.G. Shepherd, and they have these stories of sharing a stage with Elvis Presley, what he was like, what they learned from him, what they learned about how to be a great entertainer, what really matters, great advice that Elvis gave them or that they have given others. None of us lives forever. And we feel like we're becoming an archive for these stories yeah and it's so important with so many of not only the artists but the songwriters or the managers or you know in my younger days i was i was out there working with hank williams jr and his manager i I started to do some research and i'm like this guy's got some street cred all day long and but it wasn't until it was too late for me to ask the questions you know for this guy who's like, okay, I wish I had known then what I know now. It's so funny. We were, so we spent yesterday with Steve Dorf and here we are being welcomed into his beautiful home and we're walking down the stairs to his basement where his studio is. And the entire stairway is lined with number one, you know, gold and platinum records and all these awards and everything. And one of the first things that he said to me was, you know, thank you for wanting to tell my story because, you know, very often the songwriter uh, or the composer is is kind of in the witness protection program. And here's a guy who's written over 100 number one songs and his stories about how he wrote those songs and his co-writes and his experience with finding the right song or or creating the right song for the right artist are just as fascinating as the as the people who perform those songs. Well, and that that gets back to you know we're we're talking about Hank Jr.'s manager Merle Kilgore, who turns out 
boy, he was a songwriter in his own right, too, that we didn't know about until at least I, I should say I didn't know about until later days. And the songwriters, to me, are some of the most overlooked and underappreciated people out there who really aren't getting paid what they're worth. Amen to that. <laughs> and that's why I think we're also featuring not just superstars that are on stage and that everybody knows their names and faces. Yesterday, we had the opportunity to talk with Tony Brown, who, if you're an average person who's a country music fan, you might not know who Tony Brown is. But let me tell you, he has had the most incredible career producing some of the biggest artists in country music. And without him, you wouldn't be listening to half of the country music records that you listen to today. And he's so humble in the process. So humble. Yeah. I couldn't get over how humble he was. And here's the other thing, and I'm sure you experience this on your program, is just when you're in the room with someone like this, a Tony Brown or a Steve Dorff or a John Barry, a Crystal Gale, a Naomi Judd, a Larry Strickland, T.G. Shepard, they've got an incredible energy about them. And you recognize right away, and JC and I say this all the time, we get back in the car and we look at each other and we go, do you believe we just talked to blah, 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 you know, yeah. and they just told us, oh my, you know, we get so excited because we feel it's almost like we, we carry a treasure with us when we leave the room. I always thought it was... I've always said that it's the it factor. These certain art, Johnny Cash had it. Uh -huh. Obviously, Garth Brooks has it. But these artists have that it factor that a lot of other people aspire to, but just don't, they either don't get it or they don't have it or they don't want it bad enough. But that it factor, the artists, the, the, the list of artists you have just shared here, they all have that it factor and they worked to get it. Well, you know, that's so interesting. You should say that one of my favorite interviews of all time was with David Foster. And this was years ago. And I asked him, you know, 16 Grammys. We all know who David Foster is. And I asked him, David, what is star power? He gave me the best answer I've ever received. He said, when a star, when a person with star power, that kind of presence enters the room, there's a certain energy and magnetism that that follows them where they go. And when they enter the room, they wouldn't be able to hide in this room if they tried. And everyone in the room wants to be near that glow of of the person. And when they leave the room, everyone feels a loss. They want to go where that person is going. And in the last couple of days, we've heard that was Elvis Presley. Mm. I have had two men say to me, I know it's weird for us to say this, but he was the most beautiful man I'd ever seen. He had a glow about him that radiated from the inside out, and he was good to people. And what we don't understand as the populace as the public out there is those people have people that they look up to also uh, we had chris christensen on the show several years ago whose parents co-founded the academy of country music out in california they did it in their bar in hawaiian gardens california and many years later chris's mom was alive there were only a few of the original uh, acm founders left and the ACM wanted to honor uh, his mother. And so they invited her to the show and honored her and it walked the red carpet. And then she got to go to all the after parties. And they asked her, they said, is there anyone in particular you want to meet? And she said, there's one artist. And, and they go, who's that? And they go, it's George Strait. Oh, well, you know, George is busy and he's got all kinds of people. Oh, let's just try. So Chris and his mom went to the party where George Strait was. And they walked into the room, and, and of course, while this is going on, Martina McBride and Taylor Swift and all these people are coming up to Chris's mom going, thank you for what you did with the ACMs. This is fabulous. And I think it was either Montgom Montgomery or Gentry, I don't remember which one it was, found out that she wanted to meet George Strait. So as a linebacker, just basically plowed through the line, got right up in front of George's wife and said, uh, Mrs. Christensen would like to meet George. He stopped everything 
and went over and and she's in a wheelchair and he sat down and kneeled and just spent some time with her. He was so honored to be in her presence. So, yes, we all have these. I don't know if idols are the, the word, these these legends, but at the same time, they also have some that they're looking at. You know, one of the things that was said to us recently in this round of interviews that we've been doing here in Nashville is when we say in the interview, do you feel like an icon? Yeah. Do you know that you're a trailblazer? To a fault, every one of them looks at us and says, no, I'm not. No, no. They're very humble. Yeah. And then they'll point to Hank and they'll point to, uh, you know, just the, the greatest stars of all time and say, no, no, no. They're the ones that I was admiring. Elvis was the guy that I admired. I'm not an icon. <laughs> as as you wanting to be a performer, were there certain artists that you looked at when you when you started? You mentioned Leanne Rhymes, obviously. Was was there something that propelled you to want to do this more than anything? Absolutely. It was the Judds. And I had always wanted to meet Naomi Judd. That was number one on my bucket list. And I've been in Nashville 11 years. I've had the opportunity to meet almost every person I've ever dreamed of meeting through my work and through the luck of knowing people in town. I had never had the chance to meet Naomi Judd. And one of my best friends who is Kelly Lang, she's a phenomenal singer songwriter. She has known Naomi for a long time and ran into her at a party over the summer. And she said, you know, it would just mean everything to my friend JC if I could introduce you to her. And Naomi asked her about my story. And after Kelly told her the story, Naomi said, well, I'd love to take her to lunch. And so in at the end of August of this past year, I got to go and have lunch with Naomi Judd. And I'm wow. getting emotional talking about it because I'm telling you, she spent two hours sitting next to me, talking to me about her life, asking me about my life. She brought a book for me. She wrote me the kindest note. It was the most incredible experience. And I felt like I had waited all of those years and it was exactly what I wanted it to be. Wow. Wow. So it was it was it was magical, you know, when I got to meet that's how I met her husband, Larry Strickland. And and uh, we've we've remained friends and how incredible to have somebody like that to look up to. And then they turn out to be as fantastic as you had always envisioned them being. Yeah, it's special. It's really special. We're going to take another break, get another word in for another one of our sponsors. When we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with Candy O'Terry and J.C. Valeros. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics. All written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler and I approve of this message. Thanks. Back in the studio, Candy O'Terry and J.C. Valeris are sitting here with us. During the break, you mentioned, hey, I've got this great Jeannie Seeley story, and let's hear it. It's crazy, but it's true. Yeah, those are the best. You know, one of the things that I have to mention in terms of this partnership with J.C. Dawn is that because she's been here in Nashville for these 11 years and because she is who she is in terms of being a hard worker and being always so authentic and wanting to get someplace in country music, she's created so many relationships. And so I call it the long arm of J.C. Don Valera. So I come here to Nashville every six weeks. And when we're here, we record as many interviews as we can. And she is the person who really has helped, you know, open these doors. Anyway... One of the first interviews that I did here in Nashville was in September of 2020, and we ended up at the home of Jeannie Seeley. And her, she calls her cottage, which is at the edge of the Cumberland River, Pennsylvania. And she invited us in, and she brought us out on her back porch where she served us some iced tea. And we were all seated in these very cozy wicker chairs, wicker couches with nice cozy cushions. And she proceeded to tell us the story of her life. 
how she came to Nashville with $50 in her pocket driving an old Ford Falcon. And at the end of the interview, when I stood up, I had cat hair on my rear end (laughs) from her kitty cat. And Jeannie Seeley, the first woman to host the Grand Ole Opry, ran into her house, got a lint brush, came up behind me and took the lint off of my rear end (laughs) like a mother would. Right. And I said, I said, JC, please get your camera out right now. And I have video of Jeannie (laughs) Seeley taking cat hair off of this Boston girl's butt. How many people can say that? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's a keeper right there. What's next? What are you what are you two working on now? You, you, You obviously you have so many you have so many different shows going on so many different series how do you keep them all straight well first of all it's getting really hard i'm not gonna lie uh and if there are any other podcasters out there i'm sure you're all wagging your heads going oh my god uh the first is the the story behind her success we're at episode number 152 i've interviewed over 700 women from every walk of life through the course of my career, and I love doing that. So I see myself continuing to do that. I have a second show called The Speaker Coach, where I use my communication skills as a longtime award-winning broadcaster to help women be heard, particularly in the boardroom and in the C-suite. This third episode, I mean, this third podcast with JC is becoming very magical for both of us. It's interesting, when you know you're on to something, there are certain guideposts in the road. Mm -hmm. And even sitting here with you, every interview that we do, we say to ourselves, this is really starting to get some momentum here, isn't it? So I think that between the two of us, we're going to start channeling our efforts into this particular podcast. And we would like to create a relationship with country radio. Whenever we do an episode, we isolate sound bites from each episode of the prolific, entertaining, interesting things that this artist or this guest has said. And we would like to have country radio be our partner in promoting country music success stories and using our clips. Right. Because they're right there for you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that when something is special, it's also easy. This has been easy. We have and I, and I don't mean that, you know, we've worked our entire lives in this business. So it hasn't been easy to get to this point for either one of us. We've we've worked really hard. But this podcast, the conversations, the opportunities that have come to us, artists wanting to be a part of it, it has all gone so smoothly and so easily. And that's kind of how we know This is something that is really resonating with fans, with listeners, with country music people. And I think that's that's the goal is to do something that's fun and easy. But don't you find it that and it's kind of that old adage, if you love what you're doing, it's never work. That's true. But don't you find that if it's something that is like that and then you have that magical chemistry that's going on, you start pinching yourself and you're going, my gosh, is this really taking place? Is this really happening? It's true. And we were just talking about that earlier today. I, I looked over at Candy and I said, there is no one else in this world that I would want to be on this journey with other wow, than you. Wow, that's cool. Because, Thank you. you know, I mean, I've admired Candy's work and I've listened, like I sh- we talked about earlier, I grew up listening to her on the radio to have the opportunity to just do anything with Candy is a highlight for me. But then combine that with country music, which is the thing that I love more than anything in this world. And then to combine that with helping others and mentoring, it's all the things that I love. And to get to share every experience with someone that I admire and all of the amazing things she brings to the table, what what more in life is there, really? You know? No, and I get it. It's it, in the country music business is unlike any other genre. It is and I hope it's still this way, in that it's fan base. They're fans for life. They are. They follow you as the artist through thick and thin. They they want to share those stories. They want to be able to be connected somehow to that intimacy of that artist. And I don't necessarily see that in other genres like I do country. I also think that success can often be based on a little bit of serendipity and a little bit of good timing. And because of the pandemic, we kind of hit a nerve for artists because they can't tour. 
And in many ways, their ability to get out there and be with their fans has ended for them for a while. So a lot of them have gone back into the studio to, you know, create new music, to be able to release new music. But we're giving them an opportunity through our show to tell their story to their fans. And they relish every minute of it. You know, we provide them with that opportunity to to get into the ears and stay in the hearts of their fans. So how can our listeners find these shows? Our podcast is available on all streaming and downloading platforms. You can go to countrymusicsuccessstories.com, which is our brand new website. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Country Music Success Stories. Both Candy and I are online, Candy, Candy O'Terry, JC Don Valeris. Uh, and you can pretty much get it anywhere. Just Google Country Music Success Stories and you Comes will find right us. right up to the top of the page. Ladies, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Really a pleasure to be here.